Welcome back to Pedalbox, and this episode we are doing something miserable to combat the glorious weather that we've finally started to receive. Now we're on the shaded side of the house, so it's not going to be too horrendously warm, but we need to dig into all of this wiring here. And if you haven't already, do like the video, subscribe if you haven't already, and check out some of the other work we've been doing on this. And if you do subscribe, make sure you hit the little notification bell, and that will make sure that you get notified every time we do some more work on this or any of the other cars in the fleet. And maybe... We'll get this running soon, no promises. So, the first step towards getting it running is checking this wiring over, and this is what we've been putting off for a huge amount of time. We've got a bunch of other services we need to wire in, we've got some plugs swapped over for some of the other bits and pieces, but we never finished. Partly because it got cold, it got wet, and it was miserable, and this was a miserable job. And we've basically used that excuse for about two years now to not do anything more with it. And unfortunately, the time has come we need to start wiring in some additional systems that we completely stripped out on the basis of, we'll just put our own in later and it'll be fine. So last night we went through and did some basic checks, and that included making sure that this fuse box here was not full of rust and steel and was basically an, a shorting nightmare. And fortunately, it's not. In the process of that, we also identified where a bunch of our power sources come to and some of the lines that appear in our big mega wiring diagram. So I found one online which is allegedly from a 2002 Audi TT, but that also includes revisions from the pre-late 2001, and we're not sure whether this is before or after that, because this is a 51-plate car, which means it was registered after September 2001, and the changes to the wiring and various things on the loom that are noted on that diagram take place between October and November. So we could be on either side of it, but at least our diagram should theoretically have us covered. So after poking around in the back of here, we ascertain that this does not have a load of shorts. And if it does, it's not on anything that we care about. We've actually blanked off all of the tails from the fuses we've removed because we don't need things. We can just pull those off and wire things in if we need extra fuses later. But the main one we need to add is the blower motor. So we took that whole system out because that all went through the climate control module in the TT. We are not putting climate control in this. What this does have is a fuse for a blower motor, which is 20 amps, so it should be ample to run our little 70 watt blower. I think it's a 70 watt blower. Much bigger heater matrix, but I think it's a 70 watt blower. So that will be ample on there. We might even be able to get away with putting a smaller fuse in it should the needs arise. But we need to run power from that down in through our little reclaimed switch from our um, Passat center console unit. So that's one of the things we need to add in. We also want to make sure that we can identify what things are again, because a lot of our labels, uh, if I can find one, in fact, no, that's a pretty good indication of how badly the labeling has gone, because they've all come off. We identified a couple of them last night whilst we were getting through some bits, but otherwise, this is kind of okay. We just need to make sure that all of the services actually work. The systems that we're testing today, the uh, brake and tail lights, headlights, both high and low beam, and our indicators and various other bits that we'll get to in a minute, we're going to pull the fuses and just feed power into what, what I guess you could call like the outside of the fuse, so that there's no fuse in to reconnect it back through to the buses where other shorts might exist. So I'm going to pop the fuse, put 12 volts in, and just make sure that the relevant things like turn on, glow, spin up, etc. Once we're done with lighting, we're going to check the fuel pump, and that's going to be a very, very quick check. We're just going to give it a quick tap of power and make sure we hear it go bzzz or something like that, because it is dry, and obviously you don't want to run a fuel pump without any liquid in it. And then after all of that is done, we're going to try spinning up the blower fan and just make sure that behaves properly. So we do have three inputs to wire on that. We've got the common ground. We've got three different 12-volt ends that I'm guessing go through like different parts of a resistor stack just to make sure that all works. And uh, we also need to figure out how to wire those three pins into our fan control or fan selector switch. So we've got a little bit of figuring out to do, but mostly this is going to be a case of putting power into various different pins and uh, seeing what happens. And hopefully we don't get any very big arcs, because any big arcs would mean a big short somewhere, which would be bad news. Now to actually do these tests, we're going to take our little Odyssey racing battery that we've had sitting in the house for quite a while now, so there's a decent chance it's flat. We're just going to feed it into each of those different little terminals, as I said. So we've got the multimeter here. We're just going to make sure there's still a few volts in the battery, because it has been sitting for quite a long time. The last time I remember charging it was probably more than a year ago now, so it's been, uh, been sitting a while. Not to say Abe mightn't have charged it in the meantime, but... Uh, oh, that's cool. We've actually got 12, 12 and 3 quarter volts in there, like 12.7 volts. That's 
more than enough for this sort of testing, way more than we need. Uh, something else we've thought about using on these tests is a little DC converter here. This is a DC buck converter. And we were thinking because this has current limiting in it, this might be quite handy to use as like a smoke stopper. So if we thought we'd wire the battery into the input side of this and wire the output into whatever we're testing, it'll mean that if there is a short, the output voltage from this will go really, really low uh, just to you know limit the current through and hopefully stop any, uh, any magic smoke from escaping. But it's probably easier. We haven't actually really got the necessary sort of wires and connectors and everything to put this in circuit. So what we're probably gonna do is swap the multimeter over to uh, resistance and just make sure before we plug anything in, we're just gonna ohm out the terminals or ohm out the path to ground. And if we see anything really scary, like, you know, uh, probably like single digit ohms, anything that suggests we'd be drawing, you know, several amps on, on a lot of things, then we'll, uh, we'll probably reconsider. But anything that we see, you know, sort of 10 amps or sort of 10 amps, 10 ohms or more on, it's probably safe because at 12 volts at 10 ohms, you get about an amp through and you know that you're obviously haven't got like a dead short there. So it's probably quite safe. Obviously headlight bulbs are a little bit different because you are providing quite high power to those. But um, yeah, we'll see how, uh, see how that all goes and uh, start testing. A couple of final little details before we can start probing things. We do now have bare ends coming off our battery and we have largely unpainted metal. It's primered, but we have found it's conductive in places. So just while we're not using the wires, we're gonna take these little plastic spring clips, pop them over the ends of the leads and then just pop a second clip around so they can't like roll over or anything. Hopefully that should keep us from like, you know, melting anything or causing any big shorts on the body. And finally, we've also realized that we don't actually know where our ground from our headlight connector runs to. So we're gonna pop a, um, pop a continuity tester in there and see if we can find out where it pops out that we can connect the other side of the battery to. Okay, cool. So we should have both dips come on right about now. Yeah. And they're off. And we should have both high beams coming on here. Yeah. So they both work. Right, so all our headlights are fine. Uh, we can't really test the indicators properly because we haven't got indicator bulbs in, but resounding success. So around the back of the car, we've done much the same thing. We've tested continuity all the way from the front to our wiring connectors that we've modified onto the rear end of the loom made sure that uh, when we uh, make a connection at the front, we can detect it all the way at the back. And we've now actually fed 12 volts in through the connector at the front off of the brake light switch and rigged up a little chassis ground at the front as well to the battery. So in theory, when I connect our ground off of the uh, tail light, off the brake bulbs here, they come on. So that seems like a pretty big win. That all seems correct. So we're gonna go around to test the indicators and uh, tail lights and make sure they work as well now. So with all of our light clusters actually sorted, wired and tested from the fuse box, which is really good news, we can move on to some stuff that we've never tested or wired before at all. And that is our reverse lights and our fog light. Now you'll notice that this is no longer on the car because we've decided to eliminate this from the build. That is one less car that you need to buy if you want to build one of these along with us. Unfortunately, the center lens has cracked pretty badly. These as a unit are still about 40 quid for um, like an aftermarket one or even getting a second hand one. It's all about the same price where they're, they're starting off. That's the price floor. I've also not been able to get the plug that goes into the back from anybody scrapping one, and I'm not willing to pay the dealer price, and I also don't know the part number if I wanted to order it from the dealer anyway. So this is going away. This is the new hotness, and that is a very small bar, a two row LED light from eBay. One is white lights, one is red lights. They are for reversing and fog, so they are perfect, and they just come off a little three core wire that runs into the back with a common. The white cable inexplicably goes to the red LEDs and the red cable inexplicably goes to the white LEDs. I don't know either, it, I'm just gonna run with it and wire it up to what we need. Speaking of the wires, we've had to unpick the reversing cable because that on the TT sits on the passenger side and the fog light sits on the driver's side. So we've had to unpick this all the way back in the loom so it comes through over to here because we want one bundle of cables that drops down and plugs into everything we need in the center. Obviously we've identified the fog one here so that is all ready to go and we can just use the common grounds over this side and it should be fine. 
Now, in addition to that, there are two more lights that we need to add, and those go on either side of the number plate. So the number plate sits just above our light, and you'll notice that had we stayed with the original light, it would not have fit. I think the original plan when I installed this was to have the number plate sitting higher up, which is now in front of our intercooler, so that would be no good. And if we put it lower down, it will be in the diffuser, which is also pointless. So we're avoiding all of that conveniently, and we've just moved this down on a reformatted version of the bracket. And by reformatted, I mean to say we took a hammer and a crowbar to it. So that all works now, but we need to put two lights in on this side to illuminate the number plate. Unfortunately, I seem to have removed every piece of wiring coming from the fuse box all the way back to the rear number plate lights because it is capped off and there is nothing else in there. There is no cables coming to the back that match the color patterns that are in the wiring diagram. It's all gone. So on the basis that these lights will only come on when the headlights are on or when the side lights are on at a minimum and will illuminate everything at every stage up from that, we're gonna cheat and we're just gonna tee off from our rear lights because when they are on these should be on and there should be no detriment to that the load level given these are leds these are leds will easily be taken by the fuse that is in the uh, fuse box already to run these lights uh, they're not using incandescent bulbs which they would have been before so we should be perfectly fine with adding a couple extra bits in on the same line now that's the plan anyway. So we're going to remount these back into the car, get those properly fastened in with the cables all run into them as well, extend these cables down so that they attach onto this light down here, run the ground, plug the battery in and see what it does. That's everything done now. We've got the wires tested. We've also connected them all up properly. So they are now in and done. And we've done both sides. The uh, passenger side has also been loom taped and has got a little bit of this uh, plastic uh, cable guard on it as well. So that will help it to stop abrading on the piece of the chassis as it wraps around. It's not actually tight, but even so, I don't particularly want to have to redo all those wires. Over here, we've got a little four-way branch of a mess of wires. This cable is the one that runs into this uh, light and we've branched off that from the tail light, which is the outer ring. So now we've got that one in, we can plug this one into the back of the light in there and tuck away our earth strap. So this is the ground. Obviously this is very long. It's probably going to go to somewhere inside this arch. We just haven't worked out where that's going to go yet. And this just plugs in the back of the light like this. Okay, maybe it doesn't. No, there it is. Like that. So now we have both sets of lights in. The lights into the back, we just need to bolt that back in and connect up a ground strap on either side. So lastly, I'm going to take you on the journey running through the wiring for the fuel pump. Now, we know where the fuel pump relay is. That lives down on this panel and is this relay here. And from the wiring diagram, we know it takes power in from connection 30, which is main power from the battery, goes through the relay and comes back out on this blue cable back here. And we've tested that with continuity so we know exactly where that goes. And using the continuity tester, we can make sure that we are actually looking at the right locations. Yes, so this definitely feeds uh, Relay 28 down here, which is a 15 amp. Now, these three big wires are fairly easy to find, but we've had to do this for all of the small ones as well and chase them all the way around. But from that, knowing that this is the fuel pump relay, we can follow the other side, which is a blue wire with a red stripe, and chase that all the way through the uh, loom until we find the other end. Now, normally it would have gone that way to the back of the uh, car, but we did move it to the front. So it should be in this mess. Right, so we've got a candidate, which Chris is going to put a probe on on that side, and I'm going to try and reach into from this side. In fact, no, I can just reach on the front of the fuse because I'm smart. So, fantastic. That is exactly the plug that I hoped it was. I'm extremely pleased. That was a lot easier than it has been in the past. 
Now, finally, when people ask the question, have you started it? We can say no, but we are closer than ever before. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of the work that we've been doing today and last night is obviously a long way from getting the engine running. It's a long way from getting a new ECU in, but it does mean that we've now got some of the confidence that we need to shove an expensive new ECU on the engine and yeah. plug the thing in without being particularly fearful of it blowing up. You know, we've yeah. tested a lot. We found that we's, if there are any shorts, we haven't found them yet. So yeah. That's kind of a win. Hopefully there's none in the engine side loom. Obviously the majority of this is car side loom, so we just have to hope that that's fine, but that's actually been pretty well under cover compared to some of the areas under here. So I am hopeful at least that that will be fine. It's also an engine bay. It's meant to get wet, so all of the wiring in there is pretty well weather hardened, whereas this stuff isn't. This is where the worry was. Yeah, this is also where most of the modifications are. Really all we've done with the engine loom is cut it and extend it. And if I remember right, when we did so, we did actually validate on the ends of every cable yeah. what we did. Yeah. So I'm pretty confident that all of that stuff should be fine. Yeah, and that's also been pretty well hidden under, underneath the side here as well and undisturbed. So it is really the highest confidence of the modifications we've made to the entire loom. So next time we won't be starting it because we still have some more wiring work that we need to do. Obviously we need to chop some stuff for the fuel pump. We also need to plumb in our fan switch for the heater and we also need to put a new plug on one of the fans because we have two small fans currently whereas normally it has one big and one small and for reasons I can only assume is making sure people don't plug the wrong one in, they have two different plugs. So we need to address that and fix it and then possibly think about bypassing the um, fan control module because it is renowned for its failure. Yeah, we have slightly under-delivered on this episode. I said at the beginning we'd try and get the fuel pump running, which we didn't. But um, we have reached a point where the fuel pump does run. Yes. We have an air gap. It does run. <laughs> we have a sizable air gap between the two, but we know where all the wires go to the yeah. fuel pump. And if we broke that connection apart, we would ha be able to spin the fuel pump up. But practically speaking, that doesn't actually gain us anything yeah, more than true. we have right now. So I'm kind of happy to call that a wash. Yeah. So if you want to help us buy the expensive new ECU that we need to get the engine <laughs> running, feel free to jump on shop.pedalbox.show and buy some of the swanky merch that, as usual, yeah. I'm not wearing. Nor am I, actually, this time. I've got one from uh, Driven from the guys we went to visit, and you haven't seen the video from that because I haven't edited it yet, but I really should get around to doing that because these guys were awesome. I do, however, have a Pedalbox mug over there that I've been drinking lots of nice hot tea out of, despite <laughs> this being a pretty warm day. Yes, 20 degrees. English, better drink tea. Yep. If you'd like to support us further, you can go to patreon.com forward slash pedalbox show you can join us from as little as a dollar a month if you haven't already make sure you subscribe to the channel like the video tell us what a terrible job we're doing and what absolutely awful auto electricians we are and we will see you in the next episode with something that's probably not wiring because i've had enough of that for this week yeah the uh, it has somewhat dampened the mood of this nice glorious sunny day at least it was a nice day and it wasn't raining which yeah. i'm pleased we ignored it through all of the winter thanks very much for watching see you next time Well, it's definitely broken now.